Tonight, time is running out. Every single second, every single minute feels like hours. Um, and we're losing time. The hunt for the missing tourist sub comes down to the wire. And Hunter Biden backlash. What we've uncovered would suggest money laundering, would suggest tax evasion, would suggest racketeering. Republicans cry foul over the DOJ deal with the president's son. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. A race against time in the search for the missing sub. Good evening. This is Faith Nation. I'm Jenna Browder. Rescue crews continue their around-the-clock search for the deep-sea vessel missing in the North Atlantic Ocean with five people aboard. The Titan went missing about two hours after beginning its dive to view wreckage of the Titanic. The U.S. Coast Guard reported Canadian search planes picked up underwater noises in the search area, but remote-controlled vehicles sent to investigate have yet to detect their source. The five on board include Ocean Gate CEO Stockton Rush, a Pakistani father and son, British billionaire Harding Rush and a French expert on the Titanic. The Coast Guard estimates they have just hours of oxygen remaining. I'm terrified. I'm anxious. Every single second, every single minute feels like hours. Um, and we're losing time. And family and friends are praying for a miracle and calling on the world to join them. Here in Washington, Hunter Biden backlash. Republicans call the charges brought against the president's son a slap on the wrist and tonight insist their investigation into Hunter and the Biden family will continue. After a five-year investigation, Hunter Biden cut a plea deal with the Department of Justice. The president's son pleading guilty to two counts of tax violations and admitting to a gun crime. Hunter Biden failed to pay more than $200,000 in taxes in 2017 and 2018 and on a separate charge illegally purchased a gun when he knew he was addicted to crack cocaine. Republicans say Hunter Biden got preferential treatment. It continues to show the two-tier system in America. If you were the president's leading political opponent, the DOJ tries to literally put you in jail and give you prison time. If you are the president's son, you get a sweetheart deal. Because of the plea deal, Hunter Biden will likely avoid jail time. Prosecutors are instead expected to recommend probation. As for President Biden, when asked about it, he told reporters he is proud of his son. A former women's college swimming star is taking aim at the White House proposal to rewrite Title IX to include regulations on transgender issues in schools. Riley Gaines testified on Capitol Hill today about her experience competing with trans swimmer Leah Thomas and having to share the same dressing room. And we only became aware we would be undressing next to a man was when we had to see a man undressing while we were simultaneously undressing. And so I immediately left the locker room and I went up to one of the officials on the pool deck and I said, what are the guidelines to allow a man into our locker room? And he so nonchalantly said back, oh, we actually got around this by making locker rooms unisex. And so I'm thinking to myself in these brief moments, first and foremost, you just admitted this is a male by acknowledging how you had to change your rules to make the locker rooms unisex. You and the NCAA star called the rewriting of Title IX, which would ensure transgender athletes the ability to compete on teams consistent with their gender identity, quote, an abomination. Jason Yates is the CEO of My Faith Votes, and he joins us now in studio. Jason, good to have you with us. Thanks for having person. me here. Absolutely. Um, so let's start there with Riley Gaines and that hearing. You know, as we head into 2024, how big of a motivator is the trans issue for evangelical voters? Mm -hmm. I think it's a huge motivator. I, look, uh, America is admiring right, uh, her right now, uh, Riley, because she is standing up. She is standing up to this issue. And I think there's so many people around this nation who are wondering, what can I do? This feels helpless, this aggressive transgender agenda. And so people need to stand up. And this is what My Faith Votes is about, helping them do that, understand what the issues are and being able to take a stand to vote but also do something in their communities. We have, for instance, something called Summer of Action. It's helping people in their communities this summer 
do something. And people can uh, visit My Faith Votes and learn more about that and take action, just like Riley Gaines, mm -hmm. in rejecting the nonsense that's happening in our world today. Well, let's talk about your organization, My Faith Votes. Uh, you guys got started in 2016. That's right. Because you realized a lot of evangelicals were actually not voting. Yeah, not voting, and I'll give you uh, some perspective on that. That's the equivalent of the entire voting population from 22 states. So that's a huge opportunity. Christians can determine, if we show up, the outcomes of every election. I'm not saying right or left. I'm just saying influence what's happening based on our biblical values. So it's important, and we've got to get people to take a stand. Yeah, we should mention you are a nonpartisan non right. organization. Yeah. Um, and you talk to Republicans, Democrats uh, on the Hill and have had some really interesting conversations we were talking about. Yeah, um, I've had some great conversations with even Democrats in their office, people who are pro-life, who are saying, I just, I need help navigating this because I recognize, and I think we all do, if you look at the Democratic platform, it has no room for a pro-life agenda. But these individuals are very much struggling through that and saying, what can I do to make a difference? And we're helping them yeah. in that way. It's important work that you guys are doing. Um, in the presidential race in 2024, what's your sense? Where do evangelicals stand on that? You know, in 2016 and in 2020, we of course saw evangelicals largely stand behind Donald Trump. Do you think yeah. that'll be the same in 2024? It's a little bit hard to say right now. I, I talk to a lot of people. Uh, there are some very supportive of Donald Trump, and there are some who are looking for a different option. And so I think we're in a place where we've got to, uh, where Christians are going to struggle a little bit. And the challenge, I think, is that we don't sit on the sidelines if our person isn't the nominee, right? And we don't sit on the sidelines if we're maybe slightly concerned about election integrity. The th way that we impact the elections and the outcomes and the issues that we care about is by showing up and voting no matter what. Make the best choice that we possibly can. Yeah, and you were saying uh, that is actually something you were concerned about is depressed turnout in yeah. 2024. It is, and it's why we have a massive campaign to reach and motivate Christians. We're equipping them with tools like a voter guide. No matter what zip code you're in, you can see from the top of the ticket down to the bottom of the ticket where candidates stand on issues and make the very best choice that you can. All right, Jason Yates with My Faith Votes. It's great to have you in person this evening. Thank Thanks, you so Jenna. much for stopping by our studio. Appreciate it. Well, Washington is rolling out the red carpet for Indian Prime Minister Modi, but ahead of his visit, religious freedom advocates are sounding the alarm over Christian persecution in India. This has to be a focal point because this is a democracy in India. They need to step forward. If they want to be part of the international community, I think they're a major player. You can't have these kinds of massive human rights violations go unaccounted for. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom is urging President Biden to address the human rights situation for Christians in India when the two leaders meet tomorrow at the White House. And for more on this, we're joined by Elaine Dzinski, Senior Director of, of the Center on Economic and Financial Power at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Elaine, welcome. Uh, good to have you with us. Uh, so Prime Minister Modi will address Congress. The White House is giving him a state dinner. It seems like the U.S. is courting India pretty strongly here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this, this meeting is really a big deal. It's coming on the heels of Secretary Blinken's trip to Beijing, which had, of course, uh, mixed outcomes and in some ways represents one of the best opportunities for a reset uh, between a major power in Asia and, and the U.S. Uh, and both sides are quite motivated right now to do that. Uh, the U.S., of course, is looking to counter the uh, influence of China, economically, but also uh, their encroaching activities around the world, particularly in the global south. And uh, Prime Minister Modi really wants to be a leader on the global stage uh, as a spokesperson for the global south. So there's an interesting alignment. Um, there's also a tremendous interest in looking at uh, cooperation around technology, around defense, uh, military procurement, and other areas. 
Yeah. You know, when we talk about China and Russia, what is the relationship that they have with India? And, and can India be counted on by the U.S. with U.S. interests? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so I think the two relationships are somewhat different. Right now, I would describe the relationship between India and Russia as something that's highly pragmatic, at least on the Indian uh, side. It's really around uh, defense and procurement of cheap Russian oil. And in order for India to pull away from buying Russian oil, which has been a sore spot with the U.S. and others, uh, they'll need a strong incentive. Uh, but really, they're a customer of last resort for uh, for Putin and his, his regime. They're not really giving him a lot of cover on the war, not like China is giving Putin. So it's a slightly different relationship, but I would call that economic. Um, the India-China relationship is one that has a very deep trade relationship. Um, but it's also interesting because they, they occupy a similar space. So when we think about a rising India, growing in economic importance, growing in political importance, uh, just like China has grown in importance, uh, there's an interesting dynamic and, in fact, uh, maybe some tension there. So when we think about a rising India, uh, it's likely that they could coexist a little bit better next to the U.S. than uh, a, a close competitor like China. So hmm. there's some interesting dynamics that we need to, to, to look at, but there's also the potential for a risk of uh, some challenges for, for India, particularly around hmm. um, democracy and upholding democratic rules and norms. Yeah. You know, California Congressman Ro Khanna says the U.S. and India partnership will be one of the most significant of this century. Do you agree with that? And, and what do you think about that statement? it could be. It's it's a relationship with huge potential, but it's also something that's a work in progress. Uh, Modi remains very popular as a prime minister. He's politically dominant, um, but he has some headwinds on the global stage. So building an alliance with Washington would really help that. And as we uh, discussed earlier, the U.S. has significant interest in working with India as a counter to China's influence uh, globally. So uh, that being said, there are some you know, foreign policy differences that are are significant, and we really need to, you know, tread with some caution, particularly on the uh, economic side. And here I want to just highlight that, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about India serving as an alternative to China, that mm -hmm. we could potentially move U.S. supply chains out of out of China and into India. And I, th I think there are some huge opportunities for that pivoting or ally shoring into India. Um, but we also need to uh, make sure that we keep the pressure on India to uphold IP yeah. uh, enforcement, anti-corruption principles, and that we really uh, bring up this issue of democratic backsliding, right? Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's human rights, but it's more than that. It's maintaining uh, an independent judicial function. Uh, it's about right. protecting religious minorities. Um, these are important Elaine, signals. We... Mm -hmm. Most, def most definitely. I'm, I'm so sorry to cut you off, but we are out of time and we'll have to leave it there. We'd love to have you back on sometime. Elaine Dzinski with the FDD. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, America celebrated its newest federal holiday Monday coming up. Why some are calling Juneteenth a second Independence Day. Welcome back. Juneteenth Freedom Day dates back to June 19, 1865, when a U.S. general proclaimed freedom for enslaved people in Texas. The news of freedom came to Galveston, Texas, a full two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued. At that time, there were an estimated quarter of a million enslaved people in the Lone Star State. And while Freedom Day commemorates the final end of slavery, people remained enslaved in Delaware and Kentucky until December 6th of that year, when the 13th Amendment was ratified. And joining us now, Justin Gibney, president of the AND campaign. Justin, thanks for coming on this evening. Great to have you with us. Um, to talk about Juneteenth from a Christian perspective, how does a holiday like this contribute to national healing and unity as a nation? I think for one, you know, we, we have a God that's a liberator. And I think any time that our country gets closer to freedom and closer to its ideals, that's something for us to celebrate. And on this occasion, as we know, uh, there are people who were enslaved for hundreds of years that received word of their freedom. I think that's something Christians should be excited about celebrating. Yeah. Um, you know, you've, you've called Juneteenth the second Independence Day. Um, what do you make of the criticism that celebrating Juneteenth as a, a national holiday dilutes the 4th of July and the celebration of independence? 
Yeah, I don't, I don't quite get that. Uh, I think sometimes we can make an idol out of American history. Uh, our country has done some exceptional things, and we've had some exceptional transgressions. We have to admit those transgressions and show the progress that our country has been able to make from the mechanisms within our Constitution. And so we should be able to celebrate that. The, the folks that don't want to think about it, I think they don't want to admit sometimes the things that we've gotten wrong. Um, and I, and I, I don't think that should be a problem for Christians. We, we know we live in a broken world. That means that our country, to some extent, is broken, too. But we have made progress, and we should all celebrate that progress, especially on something that's such a uh, significant occasion. Yeah. Uh, you know, so in an interview this week with Russell Moore, you said Juneteenth reminds us of the sin of slavery. Is, is commemorating Freedom Day also a way of recognizing the ways America has tried to right its wrongs? I think that's right. I mean, it's, 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 it shows human dignity overcoming some of the obstacles and um, sins of, of the nation. Uh, we should be able to say, you know what, we try to make things better and our, our past isn't perfect. But as we move forward, as we join together, we can overcome the problems here and be an example to others. Yeah. Um, so what's next? You know, we said Juneteenth become a holiday in recent years. Um, Justin, what would you like to, to see next? I mean, I, I would just like to see people recognize it more that us to engage in the history and be more honest about the history, own up to that history, because that's the only way that we continue to improve. And so as we recognize the things that went wrong, the improvements that were made, we can kind of set a, a path toward really achieve, you know, really getting even closer to the ideals that we hold so dear. Yeah. All right, Justin Gibney with the AND campaign. Thank you for coming on to talk about this important topic. We appreciate your time. And when we come back, the risks and possibilities of artificial intelligence and why the quickly changing technology is presenting a spiritual crisis. The risks and promises of artificial intelligence are at the forefront of a presidential forum with AI experts in San Francisco this week. The forum is dealing with how to manage and regulate the rapidly developing technology. We'll see more technological change in the next 10 years than we've seen in the last 50 years and maybe even beyond that. Well, we need to manage the risks uh, to our society, to our economy and our national security. My administration is committed, is committed to safeguarding America's rights and safety, from protecting privacy to addressing bias and disinformation, to making sure AI systems are safe before they are released. That Congress needs to and the president highlighted the technology as an incredible opportunity while warning against the potential for harm if AI goes unregulated. With that, let's bring in Wallace Henley, an exclusive columnist at the Christian Post and author of the new book, who will rule the coming gods? Wallace, welcome. Good to have you with us. Um, so what do you make of the White House push for congressional legislation around this issue? Well, um, legislation will not solve anything. But what will solve something is going to the very core of the problem. Legislation is a, is a stopgap measure. I'm not saying don't legislate. But what I'm saying is don't place all of your hope in legislation because the issues are much deeper than that. Yeah. Uh, what would you like to see done beyond legislation? Well, my answer is deemed as, as to be irrelevant, but I still stick to it. I believe that every issue is ultimately a spiritual issue. I was a very young aide in the Nixon White House in the 1970s, and I learned at that time with every domestic policy issue we worked on, and we were working very intensely on desegregation of public schools across the country. And I came to see that in everything, there's a spiritual core to it. And the, the issue now is, is the fact that we're developing these machines and these programs and these abilities at the very time that we're, we're losing sense of the transcendence of God. We're lo losing sense of the accountability uh, to God in, at every point. So I'm not optimistic that anything that does not have that important issue in it, it's time to, it's time to face that. And that's what I'm trying to say in my book. Yeah. Uh, tell us about your book, Who Will Rule the Coming Gods? You say um, there's a looming spiritual crisis of artificial intelligence, as you were just kind of mentioning. Well, the concern I have in the book, and I, I develop it pretty fully, is the fact that we must ask the question, what, what kind of worldview uh, do the people who are programming the machines, what kind of worldview do, do, do they endorse? Who's putting the limits and, and the values into those machines? 
Who's putting the worldview into those machines? We need to understand that, and we can't pass it by. Uh, there has to be an, a, a sense of, of, of the deeper questions uh, to the point that I would wish that in every Silicon Valley company, uh, th there was a person who dealt with these, these larger issues of, of the spirit, of the human spirit. The machines, what prompted me to write the book was uh, hearing about a man who was b going to organize a, an AI church. And he said, you know, if these machines are, are as intelligent or more intelligent than 50, than a billion American mi or minds, then the issue is that the machines can only be called God, something that big. We've got to face that. And if we don't face it, we're going to face a horrible, horrible crisis in the decades and years to come. Well, what do you think that crisis might look like? What do you foresee happening if we don't I get ahead it, of this? I, I see it as, as, as John Calvin said, the human spirit is a, is a factory of idols. It is an idol factory. So I see people making idols of these machines increasingly as, as we lose the sense. And a lot of this comes back to the church and the family and what can be done there. But as people lose the sense of God's transcendence, our, answer, our answerability to God uh, for yes or no, as we move further away from that, we are going to submit ourselves to something. That was John Calvin's point. Mm -hmm. Augustine, the great, uh, the great, uh, the great uh, scholar of, of ages past, said the human heart was made by God for God and only God can fill it. And the more we attempt to fill our hearts with the things that are, that are non-spiritual, th the greater is going to become the crisis. Yeah. All right. Once again, his book is Who Will Rule the Coming Gods? Wallace Henley. It's an important topic and it's, it's a heavy topic. We appreciate you coming on this evening. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. And we'll be right back. Finally tonight, survivors are telling their story after a tornado ripped through Moss Point in Mississippi earlier this week. Eight people were trapped in a bank Monday afternoon after a staircase caved in on them. After the storm passed, a man driving by the bank noticed the wreckage and called in reinforcements, eventually helping all eight people to safety. One survivor saying she met Jesus in the storm and she's grateful to have made it out alive. And we are grateful too. That's a great story. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening. We'll see you tomorrow.